Okay, we might want to, if you're sitting by yourself, you might want to come we'll join the table so that we have people to talk to, because there'll be some discussions and things. So if you want to come and join us, it have already set up, I think that would be good. Um, as is the norm, people will kind of wander in, so we'll take, allow them to come if they're wandering in uh, after dropping off or whatever. Uh, I would like to start this morning, as I always start, with good things. So does anyone have something good that they would like to share with the group? Yes, yes ma'am. My son had a sledding accident, so we went skiing, and everything was fine skiing, and then he went sledding. And um, I'm, I have really good news that nothing is actually fractured. Oh, Did you have any confession? No. I don't know about. It. We didn't think about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just be watching. That's that's the kind of thing that sneaks up on you. Yes. I was going to say my good news is I think I came to the last coffee and that was when somebody in here, one of the moms, was saying that that the electronic devices didn't belong to the child. I don't know who that was, but I took that home and applied it, and everything went away from the child. And it all belongs to us, and he has to pay to use it, and it's been working wonderfully. <laughs> 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 he has to pay points. Once he got how it worked, he yep. was just delighted. Yeah. 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 He got it immediately because he wants his for screen time. <laughs> how was there? Good. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Anything else? Good things? Sure. Yes. I don't know what it was about December and the Christmas season, but it's we're still going strong in January. My kids are being the sweetest ever. Best friends, hugs and kisses. I love you. Like they are just the they are they have been so sweet. I realized this week I have not had to do one disciplinary like sibling interaction in probably seven weeks. It's Whoa! Like that, that's that's almost impossible. It's been a lot of prayer. So nice. <laughs> One of my students this morning walking in and I say good morning and whatever, and then she shared with me, I just got a hug from, from my brother for the from the for the first time ever. Oh. And this is a big brother, right? Yeah. It's not a little brother, so it's there's a girl with a big brother. I got a hug from my brother this morning for the first time ever. And I said, Oh, that's amazing. So that's a good thing, right? Nice yeah. things. Anything else? Yes. We had our, I think every time we had this, we have, it's after my student council meeting, so I, my student council kids this morning, I was just letting you know that they've written up a dad's club request that they did on their own, they did all the research, they want to get some easy, cool fans like they have at the track for this area over here. They've done a cost-benefit oh. analysis. <laughs> I mean, they, they shared, shared the document with me. I mean, I didn't, had nothing to do with this, and so they're very excited about making positive changes in the lower school yeah. for kids, and so it's, we have a good group of leaders this year, so that's very that makes it yeah. Okay, that's really good. That was like the intro. Would you like to share your dad's club? <laughs> Well, I got many good things to share from the dance club. Okay, yes. share sure, your good thing. Uh, she asked if I could do it in 30 seconds. I said, sure, 30 minutes sounds good. Here we go. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Rod Pinedo. I have two kids at AOS, uh, Isabella at fourth grade and Max on second grade. I'm part of the dance club and they asked me to kind of be here today and give a little report where we are and what the activities are coming up down the pipe. Uh, our membership is too strong. Uh, if you haven't signed up, Please bring your significant other to the club. There's a lot of fun activities there. We have the clay shooting uh, scheduled for February the 26th. And I know uh, last year we had the first time a woman's, a woman's team and uh, we need more you know, to participate. Uh, if you don't have a gun, don't worry about it. Come, we, got, we can help you out with that. If you never shot it before, that's fine too. Come and have some fun. You never know we're gonna need it uh, uh, to have that ability. Uh, Dad's uh, night out uh, is scheduled for the uh, March 29th. Uh, that's going to be ha happen here on the day before of the barbecue, which is the, on the March the 30th. Okay, uh, is in my opinion is one of my favorite events 
that we have is the barbecue, a lot of good turnout. Hopefully the weather will stay strong and nice. And the night before is also when we are setting up, we do we do the the, the that's night out. And like uh, Kelly, as Kelly was saying, for the moms, uh, the mom is uh, room moms. Uh, if you the teachers remind them that uh, that uh, any request that they need needs to go to Miss Colorado. Okay. Any questions for me? What was the date for the clay shooting again? Sorry. February yes, thank 26th. you. Uh, <clears throat> February twenty sixth. It's a fun activity. You guys will love it. If you've never done it, you should give it a shot. A shot with a shotgun. A shot with a shotgun. There you go. And I hear that, that, that you do give less, well, kind of lessons. So if you've never done it, they're, they're kind and they yeah. And some people are really good at it here. So yeah. yeah. Fun, okay. fun activity. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, this morning, this morning we're here to hear a little bit about our, a new program that we've introduced. We've always been working with the kids on their social emotional learning. Um, it's like an ongoing thing. But this year we have kind of really focused on it and introduced some curriculum material that, that um, has rolled out in more school apps since, since we came back in January. And um, Jackie Jaffe uh, is going to talk all about this and let you know a little bit about it. One of the things that the reason for doing this is there's a lot of literature out there talking about, you know, who are the achievers in our world? Who are the people that make things happen? Who make significant differences to society, to leadership, to education, etc.? And a lot of this has shown that it's more about the EQ, the emotional quotient, than it is about the IQ. We have been spending centuries measuring IQ and finding great tests to tell us about a child's IQ or their, their potential, if you like. Um, but now there's a lot of research going into trying to find testing that will actually measure their EQ, their social emotional skills and their learning. And when you start to dig into the research, you see that consistently people who have a high EQ are successful over consistently people with a high IQ. So it's been brought to the focus in education that this is something that we should be really working on and really trying to instill in our kids as much as their, their IQ. And their IQ we can work on, but it's kind of inherent, and our, our, their EQ we can work on, but it's not so inherent. When we actually do things about it, and we give them actual practices to put in place, it strengthens their EQ and makes them feel more confident in their decision making and their interactions with other people, etc. So we did a little bit of sharing there where you sort of shared some good things. I would like to you to make sure that you get someone to talk to. So maybe if you two want to come and sit down here so that there's someone to talk to. I'm going to give you a, an envelope that has cards in it. And I want you to take the card and talk about it. We're only going to do this for about a total of three to five minutes. But just with the people at your table, talk about the questions that are on the cards. And then we'll kind of debrief once, once you've tried that activity. <coughs> so maybe, do you want to either? Yeah, yeah, I can go back there. There you go. So that will give. Okay.
And sometimes it's just nice to take time to understand each other and to, you know, know some things about each other that maybe we didn't know before. And the more we build those relationships, the easier it is to work with people. And that that's little people as well as grown-ups. We all function in the same way. So a big part of who we are are social social animals, right? We we can feed off each other. Um, so it's important that we provide opportunity to share and to collaborate and to talk and to sing and to cry. <laughs> All of those things are important to us to be healthy. So I hope you enjoyed just finding out a little bit about each other and sharing some, some stories or some aspirations or some mistakes or whatever your questions happen to be this morning and that's just as a segue in to hand over to Dr. Jacqueline Jaffe who will tell us about our second step program at AOS. Thank you, Mrs. Corbett. Good morning everyone. I feel like you're so far away. I should have moved in a little bit. Um, but I will project and I'm really excited to share with you our social emotional curriculum second step program. I don't know if any of you have heard your children coming in with certain terminology that may sound new, like using their attentoscopes, or um, some of the songs that really stick in your head. It's intentional. Um, I don't know why this computer keeps doing this, but let's see if I can get it to cooperate. So, I mean, part of the reason why I, uh, AOS is a, I'm sorry, Okay, part of the reason why AOS is such a special place, and it has the reputation that it does, and I hope, in large part, why you chose to send your children here, is because we have a board of trustees and an administration and a faculty who are committed not only to helping your children achieve their highest academic potential, but also to help, develop, help them to develop into kind, compassionate, people who will hopefully have a very a positive impact on the world. And the commitment to that part of their education is so strong that our board of trustees made it one of the strategic imperatives in AOS's strategic plan. And um, Dr. Roots and I were tasked when we arrived here at AOS with helping to find different ways that we can support development of social emotional learning in, in the um, school environment. Now, what Mrs. Corbett said is true. It's not like suddenly the teachers are teaching social emotional skills. I mean, this has always been integrated into the culture here. Um, again, a reason why I hope, uh, uh, part of the reason why you chose AOS for your children. Um, so they're already, they, you know, they've been teaching social emotional skills on the playground when there's some kind of interaction that the kids need to navigate or when a student is having uh, difficulty confronting a particularly challenging issue or academic um, skill, or um, even if they're just getting overwhelmed by their strong feelings and helping them to calm down. But the purpose of having a curriculum is to have a structured and organized way to implement it throughout the school and to, um, to just provide a common language, right? So every teacher kind of has their own way of doing things, but to have some consistency and continuity as they move through the school, we believe will be really helpful, and the, the research seems to support that as well. So this is, uh, this is gonna be a challenge. Uh, I keep going, keep sleeping. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so, um, before I get into second step uh, specifically, I hope you'll indulge me in watching a brief video just about why social emotional learning is so important. Emotional learning centers their mind and body. Social emotional skills are the essential skills for success in school, work, and life.
social emotional learning centers their mind and body. It reduces their emotional tension so they can be open to new content and material. We find that academic outcomes increase exponentially when students are nurtured, loved, and cared for, that we get much more out of them when we first address social emotional needs. So for us, it's actually an academic intervention and not just an emotional one. If we expect students to be college and career ready, it's important for us to focus on these skills and competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. Self-awareness is the ability to identify your emotions, to be able to tie thoughts and feelings to behaviors. We find that self-awareness is one of the hardest things for young people. Being aware of their own body space and the impact of their words and emotions on other people. So a lot of what we do is reflective through conflict mediation, through circles, through journaling, having them see their own impact on the world and then how to shift that or make a different choice next time. Self-management is the ability to self-motivate, to have self-control, to regulate one's emotions. In the classroom, that may be a breathing exercise, or that might be counting five, or taking a break. So with students who don't really know how to deal with their anger, or don't really know how to resolve conflict, we're giving them a tool that helps them deal with it in a less stressful way. Social awareness is about embracing diversity, showing empathy for others. Activities might include service learning projects, addressing social justice issues. Role playing is a great opportunity for students to address how a person might have felt in a conflict on the, on the playground. We're gonna see if other people have had some of the very same experiences around bullying that we've had. You're in my boat if you have a bully now. Wow, I see a lot of people. Relationship skills are important in project-based learning. It's the ability to work cooperatively with someone, to resolve conflict. It's the one skill you need your whole life. You may not need calculus tomorrow, but you have to know how to work in a relationship, whether it's for a coworker or a life partner. You have to know how to handle conflict and how to handle challenges. Sometimes at recess, Maya would come over and like just start talking about it and saying me is it your job to make Danae's job at school hard? No. I know it's a form of bullying, and sometimes I'll say sorry to her. So you choose to be someone's ally and make their choice. Responsible decision making is considering the well-being for self and others. It's evaluating the consequences for various behaviors or actions. We do this through shared agreements, one-to-one -one problem solving, or having students debate an issue. If you were like, hey, Kushida, can I, uh, how much does an A cost in this class? And you, like, took out your wallet, and, you know, and I was like, uh, I think 50 bucks would work. Which one of us would be corrupt in that case? You're the one that's asking for the money? We're truly teaching these students to be productive citizens. We're teaching them life skills. We're teaching them how to problem solve effectively. We're teaching them how to be resilient. I think of all the billions of dollars we've spent on Title I and all these intervention programs, and, and when all is said and done, what do we have to show for it? I think we're, you know, we're trying to teach technical things instead of devoting some of the resources to teach who you are as a person. Once you know who you are, then learning becomes exciting because you've already established a discipline. It's important for teachers and principals to understand that it can't be a binder off the shelf. It can't be something that happens from 2.15 to 4.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It has to be part of the school culture. Giving teachers flexibility, giving them a range of skills, giving them different ways that it can look, and allowing them to take their own personality and match that to what they want in their classroom has been the best way to get authentic, true practice. 
If we continue to do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we always got. Is that good enough? I don't think it's good enough for the 21st century. We need to be the outliers to try things that have never been tried and see if they work. What are we waiting for? Emotional intelligence is not only 
critical for successful career, but it's critical for happiness. I mean, when I talk to parents, and I do all the time, and ask them what do they want for their children, they just want them to be happy. Well, these skills will help them to live a happier life because these are, you know, to make it very simple, playing well with others, right? That's how you get along in life. Okay, I, the video touched on it a little, and I just want to very briefly go over some of the research that supports the use of social-emotional curricula in the classroom. Um, it significantly improves social-emotional skills, attitude, and behavior, but it also led to an increase of 11 percentile points in academic performance, because when you have these skills and abilities, it allows you to, to apply your knowledge in, in more effective ways. Um, children who are socially and emotionally competent, they have, not only do they have more friends, more connections with positive peers, and are likely, less likely to be rejected, isolated, or bullied, but also they're less likely to physically, verbally, or indirectly be aggressive towards peers. So it protects them from being a victim or a target, and protects them from being that person who is more aggressive. And we know that children's social relations affect their feeling of, feelings of connectedness at school, which in turn, you know, quite logically, will affect their academic competence. Okay, so why did we choose this particular curriculum? And I say we, uh, Dr. Ruth, and I put a lot of thought into selecting, but there are several curricula out there. And we chose Second Step for several reasons. First of all, it's evidence-based. We wanted to select a program that isn't just, doesn't just make sense you know, intuitively, but has actually been studied, they have done outcome research, and we, we see that there have been very positive outcomes from implementing this in, in the school system. <clears throat> we liked it because there was some continuity across grade levels. Not uh, Some curricula will only focus on the early childhood ages, some will just be elementary, and we wanted something that could start the conversation in pre-K and carry it through all the way through middle school. So <clears throat> concepts that are introduced in kindergarten, for example, those the songs that they sing, the, um, the little uh, like tricks, you know, uh, the uh, using your attentoscope, those concepts will be carried through. So by the time they get to first grade, they'll, their teacher will say, okay guys, take out your attentoscopes, we're really gonna focus now. And they'll already be familiar with that language. So there's some consistency in the terminology. Um, we wanted to find something that was, that was worthwhile, but also easy to implement. So I call, I, this is what I call kind of like a Goldilocks uh, curriculum. It's just right. So it's not too time consuming, it's not too complicated for the teachers, but it is also engaging enough that it would want that we hope the children and we've gotten some initial feedback that the children really enjoy engaging in these games and activities. We also wanted a curriculum that included family because again, this is a conversation. We are constantly working together, you at home and us at school, to achieve the same, I think, common goal. So we wanted a program that had a way for us to communicate regularly and not just to keep you informed of what's going on, but also to provide you with activities or you know, points of conversation that you could start with your children to get a sense of what they're doing. And there are some wonderful strategies that you can actually utilize at home. And also, before you know, <clears throat> making our final selection, we tried to do our due diligence by talking to other school counselors and administrators in the community, and specifically in Houston, um, in, among the independent schools. Have you heard of Second Step? What is, has been your experience? And overwhelmingly, we heard only positive feedback. So with all of that in mind, this was the curriculum that we chose. <clears throat> now the Second Step curriculum is, uh, you know, addresses all five of those key components of social emotional learning. But they do it across four units, and every, uh, every grade level in the early, uh, in the elementary um, or the lower school will cover each of these general ability areas. Skills for learning, empathy, emotion management, and problem solving. So skills for learning in kindergarten might be, you know, how to be a good listener. So um, again, the idea of the tentoscope and um, that you can focus your attention just by thinking about it. And that the more you do it, the, be the, more you, the better you get at it. And <coughs> in first grade, let's say, for example, empathy, that might look like teaching the children that you know, people can have different feelings about the same situation. I have several conversations a day about that. Well, um, uh, this is how this one saw it, and this is how this one saw it. And I say, well, we can both see the same situation. 
and see and see very different pictures. Um, and that it's okay for people to have different feelings about the same situation. For emotion management, for example, in the second grade, it might be a lesson about how to handle making mistakes, right? Like everyone makes mistakes, but if you're feeling really strong feelings, it's important to calm down and how do you go about doing that? And then for problem solving, just to give you an example from say a fourth grade level problem solving would be about taking responsibility and how taking responsibility for our actions is actually being respectful. <clears throat> so again, it, it changes, all, although all the students touch on each of those general concepts, it will change depending on the developmental level of the child. Okay, so a typical lesson would start with the beginning of the week, teacher teaches a concept using multimedia. I mean, there are, we have puppets for the younger grades that they, they do some uh, story and discussion with. We use pictures, video, audio. So that's another part of why we thought it was more engaging and use multimedia. And so then, after she introduces the, he or she introduces the concept, then they actually do a skill practice. Because we can tell stories all day long, but what we need to do is give them the skills so that they have some tools in their toolbox when they're in the moment. And then they do, they do skill practice, they do some group discussion. Sometimes it involves individual writing for the older grades. Sometimes, oftentimes, I'll say it involves partner work. And then the teacher continues reinforcing the concept throughout the week. So you have that lesson on Monday, but then, you know, if you're not reinforcing the skill, we know practice makes progress. So they have, <laughs> so there are opportunities and there are prompts in the uh, curriculum for how to use uh, to practice the, these skills throughout the week. It may be, before you go to recess, um, let me remind you to look for uh, the people being respectful. When we talk, you know, like, so guys, when you're out on the playground today, remember we talked about um, respect on, uh, on Monday and all that whole uh, lesson, that second step lesson? I'd like for you to look for examples of respectful behavior when we're on the playground. And we'll talk about it when we get back. It can be just that, that like giving them a prompt and then having a bit of discussion when they get back. Um, the teacher then sends, sends information home for students. About every other lesson, we'll have what we call a home link and that will be communication home to you. And it will be not only informative about what it is that the lesson was, but also specific, either very short activities or discussion points that you can bring up at the dinner table about what it is that they're learning. And then there are opportunities for the teacher to do like little mini evaluations to check the kids' understanding. Because if at the end of the week, they don't understand, <clears throat> the teacher feels like they're not getting this. They're just, I mean, they're getting it, but they're not practicing it. You know what, we're just gonna teach it again next week. And there are different ways to teach the same concept. The, the curriculum actually gives you sort of alternative strategies, ways to integrate it into your, into your academic curriculum. So there are other ways to reinforce these concepts. So just to give you some, you know, an example of <clears throat> what a lesson might look like. This is lesson two from kindergarten. It's about focusing attention, and it would involve a warm-up, which would be to review lesson one, and lesson one was about listening skills. So I've heard all throughout our school, uh, the lower school teachers saying, okay guys, eyes watching, ears listening, voices quiet, body still. Some of them just go, eyes watching, ears listening, voices quiet, and then the children say, body still. So they're, they're focusing their attention, it's the same across all the classrooms. So if I'm walking down the hall and I see kids, you know, not really focusing or, or, or being um, calm, I can say that and I know they're going to know it. Eyes watching guys and they're walking in line, they say, ears listening, voice is quiet, body still. So then they'll introduce a new concept or a building concept, which is, again, about focusing attention. And um, part of that will be to play a song. Part of that would be to look at this picture. Tell me, you know, look at this picture. And this is Caleb, and he's he's uh, talking to his teacher. What is it about what Caleb is doing that tells you he, he's listening, he's focusing his attention? So they get cued into the, the body language that you have to be facing the person that you're talking to, you have to be making eye contact, you have to be looking interested. So they're learning about that, and they have some discussion about it, and then everybody stands up and does a skill practice where they try to they focus attention. It can look like a Simon Says, but it's actually helping them to focus attention on, on the teacher. 
and then a wrap up where they just review the concept. So just to give you, because you might be hearing this at home, um, this is the song that they would have learned. I will focus, focus, listen, listen, use your self talk, be assertive. Focus, focus, you listen, you listen, you use your self talk, be assertive. Focus, focus, you listen, you listen, you use your self talk, be assertive. This is the way we all can learn. This will be carried through, I think, also in first grade, so they'll be familiar with it next year, and it will be a prompt. They'll know what is expected of them, and I love the, the assertive part. You know, there's a whole lesson on being assertive, which means to use a strong, respectful voice and to know how to ask for help, right? So a lot of kids, when they, they're not able to figure it out, either they just kind of cower inside and internalize it, or they, they externalize and just knowing when to ask for help is a really important skill. Nope. Okay. Okay. So there's kindergarten, and then there's grade four. So grade four would be more sophisticated, obviously. Uh, lesson about handling put down. It's a big one, you know. We. There's a fine line, right, between, oh, just let, let it roll off your back, and you got to develop a thick skin, and it's, it's like just being boys, just being boys, or you know how girls are, to, no, we need to address it, we need to not excuse other kids' bad behavior to our children. We don't want to brush it off and have our children think we're not validating their feelings. So hand, teaching them how to handle a put-down, and so for fourth grade, they're not going to listen to a Focus Focus song, but they'll have... A story and discussion, they'll watch a video about a scenario, they'll um, talk about different possible ways to solve that problem or to, to uh, resolve that conflict, and then they'll have a handout where they pair up with another classmate and they again talk about different scenarios and how would you handle it and problem solve it together. Each lesson also comes with what they call a follow through card which is, again, a way to assist the teacher in bringing this lesson through out the week. Um, it not only, and how to integrate it into their classroom uh, studies. So, and this one, I don't know if you can see it. It says, day one, teach the lesson. Day two, play the brain builder, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. Uh, and then have students identify times when they can use self-talk during the lesson. Um, day three, have the students listen for the self-talk phrase in the, be a in the Be A Learner song. Day four, so this is great three, by the way. Um, play the song again, and then play the, a game afterwards and have the students discuss how the self-talk helped them to be successful in the game. Again, applying the skills into in a real-life situation. And then day five, have the students complete their weekly skill check. <clears throat> This is the way that the teacher can check in and say, are they really retaining this? Is it sticking? So, and if not, you know, I'm going to revisit this next week. And, you know, I'm always available for the teachers to help brainstorm if they want to. I want to do it, but I want to do it. I want to kind of integrate it into my math lesson. How can I do that? You know, what the, the uh, counselor said in the video about providing the teachers with the tools and the structure, but also allowing them some autonomy in making it something they're comfortable with and that fits with their classroom, and also they know their kids. So giving them that, that freedom to do that 
is, uh, is what we're hoping for. Um, brain builders are an amazing um, part of this curriculum. <coughs> They're actually deceptively simple games that are designed to target and boost executive function skills. We know that those skills, those most um, sophisticated skills, the final ones in our brain to develop in the prefrontal cortex, are the ones that are really responsible. They're called executive function skills for a reason. They're the skills that executives need to really be successful. The ability to um, focus attention, the ability to divide attention, the ability to recall things, the ability to um, plan ahead and foresee uh, consequences, the ability to use good judgment, all of those executive function skills. And those are, you know, they're growing from the time that they're born until, before they're born, until, you know, actually into their 20s. But it's, it, the, the burst of development is in, uh, early, is in the young childhood through, you know, probably like nine or 10. So we wanna do what we can to uh, give them specific exercises to develop those skills. And what that can look like is, again, it might look like the Simon Says game in pre-K, where they're asking them to do, uh, you know, watch the teacher, watch me, and do as I do, and having them practice starting a, a, um, starting a movement and then inhibiting, stopping it, because that inhibitory control is a very big part of self-regulation, and that is a bit, very big part of the self-management skills as, as part of this social-emotional curriculum. So <clears throat> this one is um, watch and count the number of claps and weights that I do, and use your self-talk to keep track out loud, quietly, or in your head. So self-talk can be like a whisper to yourself, or a, using your, your voice in your head. So again, helping them to, to focus their attention so that they can watch the teacher, be able to inhibit their response when necessary, and then using one of those self-talk strategies to assist them in the game. All the stuff that's happening, they don't know it, they think they're playing a game, but actually what we're doing is we're increasing their attention, working memory, and inhibitory control. So it's pretty amazing. And those brain builder games happen about every other lesson. So they're integrated through. <coughs> and then the, the part that we talked about with engaging the family, the home links. So again, about every other lesson, there'll be something sent home. These are simple, fun activities for you to complete with your child. It can be um, you know, as much or as little as you want but it's a, a way for you to understand what it is that we're teaching. I always like to know what it is that my child's learning, not just math and science, but particularly this kind of stuff. And, um, and then, for him, and it's a way for your child to kind of be proud and show you, well, this is what I learned, and look how I'm learning how to, how to control myself, and I'm using my attention scope. So, you know, this is, this is an example about managing anger. So, the, by, this, uh, by lesson 15 in grade two, your child will have learned how to do belly breathing, how to use positive self-talk, and how to use counting as strategies for managing their anger. They're gonna come home and talk to you about it, and then you and your, and your child can think about, well, what is, think about the last time that you felt really angry, okay? And read this physical signs of anger list, because again, part of the curriculum teaches the children to identify physical <clears throat> indications that they're feeling angry. My head, my face gets hot, People say my, my, my neck turns red, my, my palms get sweaty. So they can start getting used to identifying the cues, oh, I'm having an angry moment here, and then use that to decide um, which of the, the tools that they're gonna use in order to help them manage their anger. And then that's an opportunity for you to sort of model for your child, well, this is what I use. I, I like the deep belly breathing. So, and they can say, yeah, me too, mom. Okay, and then there's so many other resources that are available on the website. They have book lists for every eight grade level that are talking about these kinds of social emotional concepts. Um, they have the supportive handouts. Well, I gave an example here, a problem solving steps flow chart. This can be so useful at home. Once they have gotten to that stage where they've learned, when they learn that um, um, you know, problem solving is the last unit, so it's typically it will be typically at the end of the year where they can, you can, let's say you have siblings that are getting into it and you need to help them work it out. Well, let's get out a problem solving flow chart. Let's, what is the problem? Say the problem, then think of three potential solutions that are safe and respectful. And you can have each of them find, you know, figure out their own solution. And then what are the consequences of those solutions, positive or negative? And then have them pick the best solution. 
So helping take helping to take them through the step process for us, we that happens very swiftly and automatically. But for them, we need to break it down to those steps, and hopefully, they will become so skilled at it and master it that it will, you know, become automatic for them as well. And then there are other brain builder games that you can do at home, um, in addition to the ones that are <clears throat> that are uh, taught in the classroom. So we're really excited about it. We have got, I mean, we just started since we returned from the winter break here in the lower school. Um, I know Mrs. Corbett, Ms. Elliott, and I have gotten positive feedback already from our teachers. Um, the kids even are enjoying it. I've been in the classroom when they're glued to the video and they're doing all of the motions. So we hope that it will maintain this positive momentum. And we're also <coughs> eager to hear your feedback, right? Because we have selected this, this curriculum and we hope that it will be very successful. But you know, we are we know that we're always looking to, to improve and to find the best fit for our school. So it will be important for you to give us your feedback about how you think it's going. Now, we want you to have realistic expectations. <laughs> we're not expecting that we're gonna start the social emotional curriculum and suddenly, you know, there will be immediate change. We have to allow for the children to learn it and to, to practice it as we do for anything. But um, we're just very excited about it. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, how, how often are you planning on implementing it? Is it like once a month, once a week, or how, how do you do that? So there are, depending on the grade level, there are anywhere from 25 to 28 lessons. So it's not intended to be every week, but most weeks. Okay. So, you know, with, when we have short weeks or a vacation week, obviously those are not uh, going to work. We've had Martin Luther King, some teachers decided not to, to do a lesson that we, some did, and just squeezed it into the four days. So we're giving our teachers some latitude, but it should be two to three times a month. That's our expectation. Yes. Um, so parent of a fourth grader, so I'm wondering, is middle school doing using the same curriculum, maybe step three, or you know something similar? Is it is the same. It is second step, and it is designed for middle school. Now, middle school, <clears throat> if you have a middle schooler, you might have heard about it already because they actually started it earlier in the year. All of their resources, we have some, um, some actual tangible resources, but all their resources are online. So they have been doing it in their advisory time. And it, it again, it teaches the same basic units, but adjusted for their developmental level. So yes, there will there is continuity through that middle school. And you know, there's a the feedback that I've heard of through Dr. Rhodes is that you know teachers are really making it something that they're adjusting it based on the composition of their advisory group and also their style. So I think you know, like there's a, a, a writing a English teacher who has implemented a lot of writing and journaling as part of the second step curriculum that seems to be working really well for his group. So we're like, yes, because the end goal is for them to get the concepts and to be talking about. It. Yes. So if there's a kid, what's what's the system for a teacher or the ability of a teacher if there's a kid who just seems to not quite be getting it? Maybe the EQ is just a little lower and that either the kid's never really raising their hand answering uh, or just doesn't seem to be getting it. Do they report to you or are they kind of told to let you know, hey, I've got a kid that this just really seems to be a struggle? Well, I mean, I would say, Mrs. Corbett, you can chime in on this. I, first of all, we haven't had that happen because it's just so brand, brand new. new. Right. But I would say, like with any subject, you know, not every kid gets <laughs> multiplication facts as you know, well, the other kids do. So, you know, we, we would try to differentiate, right? If that child needs a little supplemental, yes, I am available to help them to understand that concept. Um, the teacher can, again, we're talking about a 20 to 30 minute lesson. In fourth grade, it's more like a 30 to 40 minute lesson, that once a week. And then the, the revisiting is really like maybe five to seven minutes a day. So there's plenty of time to do an extra five minutes, an extra seven minutes with a particular child. And yes, I am available for, to do anything from co-teaching a lesson with a teacher to talking to a child to reinforce those skills to, you know, maybe even reaching out to the parents saying, we think it would really help if you practice this more at home. Because, I mean, for, like Mrs. Corbett was saying, IQ, you're kind of hardwired. You get your, your IQ is what you got. But EQ, you can really work with that. Mm -hmm. And so it may be not in the same 
way, just like with a, person, a child who has a learning difference, right? The way that the rest of the kids learn uh, reading is not gonna work for that child. We have to find a different way, but that child can learn to do the reading. So it may be that we have to take a different path with this. Maybe there's more role playing. Maybe there's more, you know, maybe a child is more verbal. They wanna read more about it. And like any other subject area, you know, if someone is having a difficulty, like learning to read is a good competitive, <clears throat> there does get to a point where we'll say we need to do more diagnostics to find out why reading is so difficult for your child. And we suddenly, hey, lo and behold, find out they're dyslexic or something. And that doesn't mean that they're not going to read. It just means we have to teach them in a different way. So the same would be, this would be the same as any other subject, where there's a, an ebb and flow, and each child individually will will learn slightly differently. Um, we don't expect everybody to, to learn everything at exactly the same point. But we do have, if we call it like a window for learning, so you have those developmental markers where there's an expectation that within this, this time frame certain things will happen. You're all parents here, so you've all witnessed, you know, the learning to walk, the learning to talk. If you have multiple children, you know, if you're the if you're the parent of an only child and your child is highly successful, you take all the credit for that. That's mostly from the <laughs> If you are like me with a parent of three children and they're all different, you think, mm -hmm. you know, their little personalities and their little brains are, you know, doing their thing, and you as a parent have a huge influence, and we as educators and teachers that touch your children have huge influence on them. But they also bring a lot of what's going on <laughs> and happening with them to the table. You know, they are genetically predisposed to doing things their way and they have their own likes and dislikes and things that make them happy and things that make them sad and so forth. So there's a combination of factors. That's why this is an art, not a science. <laughs> and there's no linear sort of tra trajectory on it. It's more like there's steps of learning and then there's a stop or a decline even sometimes before another <coughs> acceleration. So the way I see it is education is a journey, mm -hmm. right? And everyone's journey is slightly different, even though they're all going to the same destination. Your kids are all going to college. I mean, that's a given. Right? You can sort of just exhale and know that that's going to happen. I've been doing this too long for too many years with kids who are tripping over themselves, not able to do anything, and they're now in highly functioning jobs. Right? So we see them and we get caught in our, kind of, our lens of seeing them at a certain time in their journey. And at that point in their journey, they might be having struggles. But if we were to kind of follow up with that same child that was having a struggle in second grade over something and fourth grade over, if you look at them now as an adult, it's really quite funny. You know, I have students come back to see me and I'm like, you're doing what? <laughs> and I remember this like snot-nosed little fourth grader who was like, oh, making my life miserable on a daily basis, right? So it's that sort of wow moment that you know when you've been doing this for long enough that it's, it's, it's doing what um, Dr. Jaffe says, you know, you have to reinforce it, you have to practice it, you have to really believe in it and, and bring it into your practice as a teacher and that's what we're hoping this will allow our teachers to bring it into their <coughs> classroom so that they can remember to keep, you know, keep making it a priority. We, and we kind of presented this with, this is <coughs> one more thing on your plate as a teacher. This is the plate. This is the plate. If we don't have a relationship with kids, if we don't make sure that they can function socially and emotionally, there's no point in teaching math, right? Or teaching science or teaching some subject, you have to remember that you're teaching a child. And at that, on any given day, that child will be more ready, less ready to learn the new concept in math or science. And so we're trying to hit them on a high, <laughs> get them when they're eager to learn, you know, do the warm up activity. I mean, like, we, I deliberately gave you those questions this morning. That wasn't just random. That was to make you feel more comfortable, more engaged, more ready to listen to a presentation. So teachers have those tricks that they try to use to get kids warmed up, ready to learn, get the wiggles out, 
you know, all the little skills that they have that, that they bring to the table having been working in this field for a long time. Now they also have the support of a wonderful curriculum that um, Jackie and I have you know, investigated and brought here and, and we are getting really good feedback thus far. It's very early in the game, you know, we only just started it, but the initial feedback has been very positive and so that's, that's kind of half the battle, right? Once you, if someone's enthusiastic about something and sees the value in it, then that has the knock-on effect. So this will complement our Capturing Kids' Hearts and our School of Hearts and Minds. All of these things are complementary. One doesn't stop when another one starts. We're not changing anything. We've always been known, that's our tagline, is the School of Hearts and Minds. Uh, we brought in Capturing Kids Hearts as more of a classroom management program and you get to see some of that with the welcome as you come in the door, people saying hello, the good things, the ending with launches, all of these things that we do to try and engage and connect. So this isn't a replacement for any of that. This is just something that will hope, hopefully bring out the best in all of the other other components. I mean, I think um, for me, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to have specific skills. Like as a parent, yes, if somebody asked me, of course I want to teach my child good problem solving skills. Of course I want to teach them emotion, you know, how to manage their emotions better. But in the day to day, how often do we, you know, do something on purpose to do that, to practice that? So having somebody, having a home like where, okay, play this little game with your child and have fun, but also know that you're addressing these skills. I think as for our teachers as well, yes, they, they want to infuse all of these good skills in the classroom, but having something that will help them to address it specifically and know that they're practicing that particular skill is so helpful, right? Instead of just putting out fires or addressing those situations as they come up. Yes, you have a question. Sports, as I watched, in second grade come out and start <coughs> kickball. Um, how far can this extend into the community? By which I mean, like, we've seen coaches from other schools who shall remain nameless um, behave very badly in front of our second graders. And we you know, had to contextualize some of that. There's a lot of shenanigans during PE. Um, it seems like you know there are a lot of areas kind of in these kids' life connected to AOS that could benefit from like kind of reaching us out further. Mm -hmm. Like, is that in the works? Is that a tool that can happen with this, or is it all going to be on the teachers? Because I, I like I empathize with them having to like find this and make it relevant to everything. But there's not always communication between like PE and kindergarten. And I would say like we received an email as a group saying kindergartners are having some trouble understanding the concept of Black Day. And then I asked the teacher like, I, what is my child's involvement in this, if any? And they're like, we don't know. Like they didn't communicate anything to us. And so I feel like you know, this can break down as you pass out of the classroom. Thank you for that feedback and the question. I think it's it is important because you know we are a big school, and the and Ms. Corbett can speak to this. I think the benefit we have the, you know all of these fantastic enrichment activities, um, but you know sometimes there can there may be communication breakdown. So it is our intention to it's not just going to be on the teachers. We also will be sharing these lessons not for them to teach with with the enrichment teachers, which also includes the PE coaches. Not with the intention of them to teach specifically the lesson, but to reinforce the skills in their uh, when, when they're with the kids. Mm -hmm. So it will not be with the same intensity that the teachers are teaching it in the classroom. But yes, we are hoping that the language will permeate the entire school. Now, with respect to going out into the community, that's where we have to ask for your help because then that's why we, we wanted a curriculum where you're in the know and not just in the know, but also adept at doing these skills with them, right? You're, you know how to coach them through this. So if you're at a game where there's shenanigans and you and you know your child knows the problem solving, and, and by the way, for, th for a second, third, and fourth grade, 
there are specific lessons about how to handle shenanigans on the playground. So they talk about that and how to go about problem solving it in a healthy way. So you'll be aware of that and you know, we, we can, to the extent that it's possible, control what is happening here at school, but when we're talking about out in the community, I think that's where we're excited to be able to share with you what it is that we're <coughs> teaching the kids so that you can sort of echo it when they're with you out there. And you know, hopefully there will be sort of the ripple effect. And, and I would say that's in school. So this has, it, it originates from the classroom teacher because the classroom teacher spends the most amount of time with the children. So the, the classroom teacher is going to be teaching it. We talked about who should, who should deliver it. Should it be the classroom teacher? Should it be, uh, should it be Jackie? Should it be me? Should it be Kelly? We discussed that. But really to have the most impact in your child's life, the person that touches them the longest and the most is the person to deliver the curriculum. So we, that's why it's the classroom teacher. But that being said, it, it, the impetus for me, from, for my division, will be that everyone who works for me should know this curriculum, should understand it, should have at least looked at the curriculum, looked at the videos, have the vocabulary down, and so forth. And whatever we have to do to make that happen, we will try to make that happen. So in other words, um, we're just rolling it out this year. We're doing it from now until summer. We will then reflect. So, so this is kind of our, our pilot process. We would love feedback from you as a parent. How is it impacting your world? Are you hearing about it at home, etc.? We will be asking teachers how, how easy or difficult was it? We will be having you know, a lot of feedback before we go into next year. As we move into next year, some of our professional development that we will deliberately schedule for coaches and enrichment teachers will be to review second steps, will be to talk maybe with you Jackie, maybe with me, about how, what does this mean in your subject with your kiddos, right? So that is our responsibility to make that happen and we will be making that happen once we have kind of some feedback. What was really exciting for me actually was that as we were rolling this out and having the meetings, there was a big shout out from our enrichment teachers that they wanted to know about it. They proactively asked. They didn't wait for us to say, we want you, you know, you won't be actually teaching the lesson, the, the uh, 20 to 30 minute lesson, but you need to be able to reinforce the lesson. Um, they were asking, they were kind of putting their hands up and saying, can we see it, how do we see it? And, 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 and Jackie has been sending them some information, some videos, some, some online resources that, that they can kind of familiarize themselves with some of it. So we have good people here because they're asking the right questions. So that always makes me feel positive that we, you know, we, we will get traction on this and it will make an impact. To some of your other kind of piece of question like, playground etc we are also just so you know we're also looking Kelly and I are taking this on to look at our playground and the size of the playground and hope what's happening in the playground and thinking as we go into our next school year about doing some changes to our playground and what happens on there during recess time also we're thinking about even how many, uh, you know, at the moment the full grade level goes to, to for PM for playtime recess at the same time? Is that the best way to do it? Is there an alternative? What can we look at? So we are also recognizing that the playground space we have now is very different than the playground space we had before, and in some ways it's much better, and in some ways there's some challenges. So looking at those, and instead of just kind of throwing a band-aid over a problem, we're going to delve in and clean out the wound and find and really do a, a kind of deep analysis of that and come up with some different solutions for next year. I mean, I had no idea until becoming the parent of a sporty boy, um, which was kind of the opposite of my upbringing, that like so much of their lives and social interactions are focused about all of these physical activities, which is why I bring it up. And I know that there's like a group of parents who regularly take on the coaching responsibilities. And I know like for me or my husband, like 
they don't, we don't know exactly you know and want to close that and we so also far. in that process we will also talk to PE coaches will will obviously bring in what's happening in PE so we have a lot of suggestions we're already brainstorming and we have notes and notes and notes but we have to now share out and, and really find a, a, a long-term solution I, you know I'm done with kind of the, the band-aid approach and I think that's why I'm also really excited about Second Steps. I'm also really excited that we have a full-time counsellor. You know, there's so many things that are that we're getting traction on f to make things work <coughs> better. We are blessed to be in a wonderful school with great resources and, and lots of great people. Um, a lot of what we have to do is to get everyone, you know, on the same path, right? And not sort of pulling in different directions and, and that, that's our next maybe challenge to go that way. But you know, your feedback, what we hear from you, we take very seriously. So that's why I'm saying, you know, anything you're seeing, whether it is a recess thing or a PE thing, whatever, please, you know you can come to any one of us, have a conversation, send us an email, you know, yeah, there's a limited amount of hours in the day, but we will fit you in because we think it's really valuable and we're constantly learning and trying to grow and change um, you know I've as I say been doing this for a long time but education is changing I actually have stopped saying I'm in the education business when I meet people I say I'm in the relationship business because that's really truly if you don't have a relationship at any level you can't teach it so we're trying very hard to make that our, our kind of um, focus and I feel very, very blessed. When I came here five years ago, I didn't have an assistant head of lower school. I didn't have a full-time counsellor, right? Um, so the more we are really focused on some of these things and getting the right people in the right seats and moving it forward, I think we will be very successful. So this is one more thing that we're gonna you know, see if we can help our kids. We have great kids here, but, but many of our kids really do struggle socially and emotionally. They may have a 130 IQ, a 124, you know, you great IQs and you're like, mm. <laughs> okay, but sometimes that's a challenge to have a high IQ. It's not actually a blessing. It can be actually a crippling effect of, disaster zone if you like so we are in the business of wanting all of our kids to be the best people they can be and they all have great futures ahead of them because you as their parents are making good choices you know they have you think of a checklist for success their checklist is is well is well ticked off really and truly so now it's just a case of trying to get over the bumps and pick them up when they're in the, the dips, these things are going to happen. And our job is to support you guys in doing that, because we're just one team. We're all working for the same end goal. And I would say uh, my experience of each of you individually has been that, and I remember Kelly stopping in the hallway and James is like sobbing over something, and it was kickball related, and like, I think you were leaving. You're like, let me go and get a tool that will help with this. Like, I don't want to be like, so why don't you solve all of our children's problems? So like, why isn't this done yet? Like, I really appreciate that about this team. Um, and I just, I see so many applications of it, like kind of within this community that could be helpful. Yeah. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. You see and interact more with, you have more knowledge than we do of the kind of inside the school, little back, uh, what do we call them, parking lot conversations, you know, you get that even the outside of school sports, because I'm going to tell you, that comes onto campus. Something that happens at a basketball game the night before is in school that next morning first thing. Kids can't shake it off and some kids find it really hard to shake it off, right? So those are the kind of things that if we're a good team, and we can work together and you've got a good relational capacity with your teacher, you can give them a heads up. Yeah, there was a really tough basketball game last night and there was some... That teacher is like, well, she's got her armor on ready, ready to use her tools, right? 
if she knows nothing about it and kids are coming in and slamming things, you're like, what is going on, you know? So they do their little check with the shaking hands and that's when we try to get a sort of sense of, and we all use it, we all do our little, you know, and I, I mean, some, that's why I'll, I'll stand out to the front sometimes in the school or I'll stand and sit and change my spots because I'm trying to kind of feel for the, get the feel for how it's going to go down. Um, but you know, give us a heads up, give your teacher a heads up, have that feeling that this is your school, you know, you've chosen this school. So that's what we really want, is work together. Where what we don't like is the blame game, right? We're in the problem solving business. We can all be problem listers. It's very easy to write a list of problems. It's harder to come up with some possible solutions. But that's what we want to do, okay? Well, I think this is fantastic, and I'm so thankful that we're at a school that wants to make this a priority, and that we have you and Dr. Ruth, and the administration is supportive. So just thank you for focusing on this and not just the other. Y'all are great. Didn't you say you were going to start the day with a dance? Didn't I see you post Oh, did you? We're working. We're working on it. We also have um, a, a whole school agape um, performance agape, so we've got to get something to them. So, thank you all. Thank you.